Hi, I'm Mark Randolph, co-founder of Netflix and six other companies. Over the years, I've heard that will never work thousands of times, but I've learned there are things we all can do to increase the chances that they will. So join me for That Will Never Work. Hey everybody, welcome to That Will Never Work. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast or receive an invite to our That Will Never Work Discord community, simply come to markrandolph.com. So many of us dream about our passion projects becoming full-time gigs. And today's guest, Allison Wickham, is one of those people. She's into honeybees. And she's founded the Siller Pollinator Company, which does hive maintenance. Or as she describes it, it's like a pool boy, but for bees. Her initial uptake has been pretty good, but she's struggling to scale. She has an alternate idea, which she calls Adopt-A-Hive, but that's got a nonprofit element, which also has her struggling to find traction. So which direction to go? How can you take something which is so valuable to the community, but yet have so much trouble getting things buzzing? Well, let's find out. So Allison, welcome to That One Never Work. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Maybe a great way to start would be for you to just kind of jump in and tell us what your uh, your business does and how it's doing, and then you can kind of figure out a way to segue into what we should talk about today. Yeah, sure. So my business is Siller Pollinator Company, and I founded it with a mission that is simple but has uh, become quite complicated, which is that I want to help people help pollinators, full stop. Um, and what that looks like right now is we manage a lot of honeybee hives for folks. We do consulting to help them with that. Um, we install pollinator habitat, meaning planting wildflowers. And we also help foster native bee populations, help foster butterfly and hummingbird populations. Uh, we help people get connected to the supplies that they need to do these things. Um, we have classes to help people get connected with pollinators. Uh, because there's a lot of people in the world who realize that pollinators are in trouble and they want to help and they don't exactly know where to start. So that's where we come in. Um, and so any any uh, any project that is going to help pollinators, we say yes. So give me a sense of the scale of this. I mean, how many people are you helping to help pollinators? Yeah, right now it's in the hundreds. Um, we geographically spread ourselves across pretty much the entirety of Central Virginia at, at this moment. Um, but we do have a couple of programs and services that are a little more scalable and widespread um, because they're mostly maybe digital. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a small and humble company that has grown from just myself and a couple of hundred dollars. Um, but we, we're working on it. We want to spread much farther and help more pollinators and more people. So you mentioned that you have grown from just you and a few hundred dollars. And how many people now do you have uh, traipsing across uh, Virginia to, um, to help you? So officially, we are now a team of uh, five. Um, but there's also my friends and family that are out there rallying as well. So. And just to give people an idea here, um, what's the core thing that, it, what's the most pop common thing that's done? Not, not, I don't need a list of everything that clients might want you to do, but if you had to say, I got to pick the one thing which most of them want me to do. What is that? Yeah, the most common service that we provide and the largest revenue generator is our hive management service. So we manage honey beehives for farms and estates in Central Virginia. Are there any people for whom you're doing other services that you don't manage the hives? Is someone coming, yes. just hiring you to manage their milkweed uh, habitat? Correct. Yep. We have that too. Many? Um, fewer. Um, you know, I gut check 65 
95% of all revenues are from hive management and everything else is everything else. And I guess the number, that I'm, and I'm, by the way, I'm probing you on this stuff for a reason. So don't, I'm not just being a, a difficult, but so 65% of the revenue, I get it. Or how many clients do you have who you don't manage their hives, but yet you make significant revenue? In other words, the 35% of the revenue, I'm trying to get a sense of, is that other services to people you're already doing the hives? Or are these totally mm. different type, types of clients? Um, pretty much the answer is both. It divides because a large majority of our hive management clients will also participate in some other service. Um, but we also have quite a few clients who want us for something very specific. Um, I'll give you an example. We just planted five acres of flowers for an energy company, right? And that's the only thing that they've contracted us for. Um, but then I also have hive management clients who say, hey, what should I plant? And then we acquire that pollinator habitat business through that, through that um, channel. Um, I know just enough to be dangerous. So I've got to be careful. I got to make sure I ask the right questions so that people who basically have never ventured off a sidewalk before know what, we, what you and I are talking about here. Um, so I do, as I mentioned before, I have um, orchards. You know, I have nice. hundreds some odd fruit trees. So I understand wow. the critical role that pollinators play in the quality um, of your crop. Uh, For sure. And I know you can certainly have it naturally pollinated just by whatever the natural, um, uh, what do you call it, that fauna? Yeah, the natural yeah. birds, insects um, that would pollinate it naturally. But that if you really want to supercharge um, your yield, you bring in bees. Um, mm -hmm. And what are the hives that you manage? owned by the land homeowner or are these someone else's bees that you're managing? There's both. So I do have hives that I manage and, you know, we, we, we use them for pollination services, just like you're describing where we'll bring them right now. I've got some bees on a pumpkin job here in Virginia. Um, and we have hives that we use as resource hives, meaning that we sell bees and honey out of them. Um, but the majority of the hives that I'm managing are owned by the landowner and they are the owner of the hive. I'm the operator of the hive. So in, um, in <laughs> we're going to get so detailed on bees. People are going to be going, well, all right, enough on the bees already. <laughs> but I do know here in California and certainly in the county that I live in, which is an ag county, um, this bee stuff is serious. Um, and especially if you go to inland, the Central Valley of California, where you have thousands of acres of, um, of fruit trees, that there's companies who basically truck in uh, semi loads full of beehives, leave them there for a week or two, and then they move north to the next location and keep doing that sequentially. Uh, I assume that's a totally different thing that does, does take place and that those people manage their own hives generally. Correct. Yeah. The revenue that they're generating is on the pollination service itself. And they're doing it with so many hives, like you say, that it's, you know, $200, $300 a hive, but you bring in 20,000 hives. So that really adds up to a full scale business. And that's the main service that they're providing. And they might, they might do that on the California almond crop. And then they move on to Florida and do the orange blossoms. And that's how they're sustaining their business is they're moving large numbers of hives around, which is a completely different model than what I have. Um, I do some of that work very small scale locally. So you basically are filling this gap or this, you're filling the bottom side of this pollinating market that if someone is really in this for, I'll put it this way, they're in this, they're in the ag business for, a, for business. In other words, yes. they, that for them, the crop they're raising is money. And so I'm gonna bring the bees in for two weeks and then get them out. And the people who do that manage it themselves. But that when you're smaller and you have a small orchard mm -hmm. or used mm -hmm. to have backyard fruit trees, you, those big guys, you, you, a little suburban neighborhood does not want a semi load of uh, bees showing up that they then yep. 
just want a hive or two and that you're, there's this hole in the market that you're filling. Is that basically right? Correct. Yeah. There's um, beekeeping as a hobby has grown exponentially since the new the news started covering this colony collapse disorder topic, um, which is, you know, the honeybees are in trouble and everybody caught wind of that and um, beekeeping exploded in popularity. And with that, luckily, also. People learn that pollinators are in trouble, all of them, not just honeybees, um, that, you know, the human influence on the natural environment is causing them some stress. So people have really gotten, you know, jumped into this hobby and something that they're really interested in. And so my company is sort of in that niche between hobbyists and commercial beekeepers where we're professionals that know what we're doing. We know how to take really good care of these bees and help people who have maybe got no idea what they're doing. Um, Cause there's a learning curve or um, this, this is a very specific type of animal husbandry. And it's, I always tell people it's not rocket science, but it's not easy. So we're there to help. Yeah, it sounds, I mean, I, I totally get it. And I totally kind of understand the basic business model. And just again, just to make, to tie this together, as I mentioned, I'm a bit of the orchard. And I do have um, people who help me. Um, it's a mm -hmm. lot of pruning to do. It's a lot of care um, all year round for fruit trees. Uh, and so rather than doing it all myself, I have a company who specializes in home orchard care. So this is right. in some ways a very similar model. This is home um, pollinator care. Exactly. So it sounds like you're doing okay. What is it that you, uh, you want to talk about today? Yeah, so the thing that's been on my mind since March, basically, I've been just tormented with this sort of decision making that I seem to be stuck on, which is what do we do? Do to to scale this business or not and so i'm 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 really fortunate in that we did we just started doing something and it sort of is paying the bills and it's supporting a couple of people and we are out here doing what we love and we're supporting people and we're supporting pollinators but um for instance i can't afford benefits for my employees so you know, the question becomes, do we want to grow and make some more money and build a bigger team and really create a career for people and really expand our influence? Or are we happy where we are? And my answer is, I would like to grow the business. And now the next question is how? Because with the Hive Management Service, we are bound by geography, weather, uh, whether or not the sun is shining. Um, if it's dark, we're not making money. If it's raining, we're not making money. Um, so if we can't drive there in a day, we can't do the project. And I'm trying to look at, you know, when I started this business, I said yes to everything. I have all these revenue streams. My bookkeeper is actually here today and she's like, oh my gosh, why do you have so many revenue streams? You know, but um, it's allowed me to have all these doors open and now I get to decide which ones to shut and which ones to pursue. So we have this Adopt a Hive program right now that I would like to revamp and relaunch and see if it might be able to sort of make money while we sleep. Um, so this is a small program that we have that we've paid very little attention to and done no marketing for, but the idea came to me because I had nonprofits that were interested in having beehives, but they didn't have any money to pay for our services. So we set up beehives at the nonprofit locations and we sold shares of the hive to customers, um, at low, you know, 50 bucks a year hive share and that financially supports the hive so that the nonprofit can have that beehive for free. And surprisingly, I have a 98% customer return rate in this program. 
Customer being the nonprofit? Customer, or customer being, being the person who adopts the hive? Yes, folks buying shares of the hive. And how many people, is, how big is the sample of this? It's like 60 people. So it's not a big sample. Okay. I do have some thoughts about this. Um, and let's talk about, uh, I will confess, I'm um, a kindred spirit with your bookkeeper, your accountant. <laughs> what, missed what it was. And in fact, since she's there today, maybe we can get her on and the, the three of us, the two of us can bond over how many there revenue you streams you have. Right. Um, yeah, you're doing, you're doing what I would have done at the beginning too, which is I would have just tried a lot of stuff. Um, right. In other words, you're going, I, my purpose, my why, is I really want to um, help pollinators. I really think it's really good for the food supply chain. It's good for people. It's good for the environment. It's good, and it needs help. Yeah. So you started from a place which um, you cared about, which is great. And you said, let's think of all the possible ways that uh, we can do this. And we can certainly plant wildflower, ha plant better habitat. We can certainly support other things. We can place hives. We can support hives. We can help nonprofit. You tried a lot of things. So great, fantastic mm -hmm. work. But the reason you do that is not to build a repeatable model that consists of 30 or 40 different things. The reason you mm -hmm. do that is to try and hopefully have the one that works smack you in the head and go, me, dummy, I'm yes. the one that actually, of all these things you've tried, makes a difference. Um, and I've, I've talked about this a lot, but it's kind of a very, very extremely common principle at a startup where you just got to test things. And it's not how good the ideas are. The ideas are easy. It's how clever you can be about quickly, cheaply, and easily trying things. And the reason you do them quickly, cheaply, and easily is because they don't need to be good. Because if it's a bad idea, no matter how perfectly you execute it, it's going to not make a difference. But if it's a good idea, that no matter how poorly you execute it, it will immediately show up and say, this is a great, great thing. So mm -hmm. um, you cannot keep doing everything forever uh, because it just won't be repeatable or scalable. Like you said, you'll run these problems. You can't have people who specialize, you're, you're saying, I'm trying to hire someone. Well, I need someone who now specializes in planting wildflowers uh, as well as someone who specializes in, and it just narrows it down. And to get to the economic efficiency at the beginning, you're going to have to pick, and I hate to break it to you, probably one thing and do mm -hmm. that one thing really, really well. And I'll come back in a second to how to help you figure out what that one thing might be. But one thing you said really struck me, which is that um, I, I, I can give people a living, but I can't really give them a good living. <laughs> in other mm -hmm. words, I don't have enough to really pay them benefits. And I get right. it. You're struggling. Well, the red light that went on for me is that your unit economics are bad if that happens. Yeah. It means you're doing something that someone is not willing to pay enough for that you can afford to do it, or at least not do it in a scalable way. Um, and I'm not saying that all jobs have to be uh, 80 hours, um, $80 an hour jobs. Um, because certainly fast food industry has figured out how to do that, but they've done that by not having one McDonald's in one town serve uh, one type of meal and one of the next town serve a different one and not yeah. have different employees in different ones. It is the most mechanized, automated um, system in the world. And, and that's because they, they realize that people are not, that some people will spend $40 for a hamburger. Um, and when that happens, yes, we're going to spend this incredible care on the hamburger. But you get where I'm going with this analogy rather than me beating it to death. Is that you, um, if you want to pay your people like um, Michelin starred chefs, you've got to find a business that people are willing to pay those prices for the hamburger. Um, and the, all of this should leap out of what you're doing. And I also think that if you specialize, um, it will f actually help you expand. Mm -hmm. The reason I started out this whole conversation trying to focus down who your core customers were is that mm -hmm. when it comes to defining what your market is, what you do, 
you don't define the market by drawing a boundary around all the things you do. Like here's all the stuff we do. Um, and when you, cause if you draw a boundary and you're including things that are what you do, you end up with this incredible uh, gerrymandered district. You end up with like a, you know, a map of Bosnia. You end up with all these weird <laughs> contortions. And a much, much better way to define your market is define it by its center. So when someone says, what is your market? You pick the center and you have a really clear understanding of that. It doesn't mean you don't do things that are outside your center, but it means that you make sure that you really deliver on the center. So I think you would agree that your center is we service hives. Yes. Um, now, which means a customer says, I'm willing to put in 30 hives and have you service them. Can you also do some planting? Yes. But if someone goes, uh, no, I don't want the hives. I just want the planting. No. Okay. Unless you think, well, maybe I'll do this. Then they'll eventually put in 30 hives. In other words, once you kind of know that your center is here, it really helps because then your advertising and your marketing is so much clearer. It's so hard to create an image in someone's mind about what you do and what you stand for and what you're good at, that you have got to be crystal clear and you've got to smack them on the head and go, here's what we do. Here's what we do. Here's what we do. Here's why we do it well, do it well. And if you're saying it's all this stuff, yes, you reach more people, you reach them in a much shallower way. And it's much better to reach a smaller number of folks, people who really want your product and really communicate it. And focus also allows you to hire the right people. If someone's like, I love wildflowers, but I hate bees, um, they're not the right person and you know it. Because I kind of tolerate bees, but I'm really into wildflowers. That's not the right person either. You want someone who's phenomenally good at bees. And yeah, I'll learn how, I'm interested to learn how about, more about habitat, maybe learn how to plant better. You get the idea. Um, I just think so clear to me that you've got to say we're in the bee business here. I'm not, and don't necessarily mean supplying bees, but you got to say, my customer wants bees at their house. They're a certain size. They have a certain income. Um, what can I do to help them? And it may be basically saying, you know, and I'm also sensitive to your issue about, and stop me here if you need to. But otherwise, you know, if you ever listen to the podcast before, I'll just keep going and going because I get so excited about this stuff. Um, is that, you mentioned, um, I can't do it when it's raining. I can't do it when the sun's not shining. Well, if you have a subscription business, that, the money flows in, whether it's raining or not. The money flows in, uh, doesn't stop coming once the sun goes down. Doesn't stop. In other words, you change the nature of what it is you're selling. And rather than saying, I'm selling the hours that I'm out at your place dealing with your bees. You go, no, what I'm selling is you having amazing honey. What I'm selling is you having amazing harvest. What I'm selling is you being able to sit on your patio with your lemonade and your New York Times crossword puzzle and not out there futzing with your bees. That's yeah. what I'm selling. And, and that protection and comfort is seven by 24. You were going to yeah. say? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, a huge piece of it for most of my clients is you know, what I'm selling is that they know they're doing something good. They know that they are helping pollinator populations. Well, I would do some research here and try and understand, are there a lot of, I mean, well, I guess I'll say it. I'm always cynical about that, which is, yeah, I know you'll find people, mm -hmm. but when I'm looking at what my possible market motivations are, when I define who my market is, like I say, okay, my market is basically um, having people have bees without having to worry about it. Um, what I'll do in my mind, this is a fairly common marketing technique, is I'll create personas. So rather <laughs> than having it be, I don't know if you've done this work before, but you'll basically say, I'm going to envision the quintessential customer. And there could be more than one. One could be customer A is um, 
uh, John and Maria Johnson. Uh, John, John is a full-time, um, uh, John's a housewife, house husband. Maria works for a major corporation. They have an income of over $100,000 a year. They have a really nice house on three or four acres. And they've got a handful of fruit trees in the back. Um, and they think it'd be really cool to have bees, but they don't know shit about beekeeping. And uh, you can picture yep. who these people are and what their motivations are. It's the pollinator, schmollinator. They don't care. They do, but that's not, they like the idea of having this beautiful backyard. It's like the explosion, maybe not in Virginia, but certainly in California of using grapes as landscaping. These people aren't going to make wine. And they're not going to make good wine, uh, but they love the idea of having um, an acre of grapes in the backyard because it speaks to some romantic image of what the landed gentry might have. And you've got to understand that what John and Mary's motivation is. There's also another customer type who is um, Chris uh, and his partner, um, and they uh, live in a, a smaller place and they make very much, very little money. In fact, uh, it, both of them work in the local coffee house, um, but they really care. They've been reading a lot about the bee population and it really bothers them. Now, they have a different motivation. They have a different income level. They have a different thing they can do. And the product that you would sell and the way you'd market to them is going to be different based on those two. And you would think through who are these personas really mm -hmm. and use that to define what your market should be. Like, what should I focus on? Yep. And I picked those two for a reason. That it strikes me those are two really interesting products. That uh, one is, I solve the problem of you having bees. Right which is, it's turnkey. If you want to buy your own bees, I'll help you buy your own bees. And you own them now, and I'll just, but it's part of a service. It's an annual, annual or monthly contract. You don't need to worry. You just know you've got little bees. And I'll even get the honey and give you the honey. It's just full service thing. And you go, oh, this is so cool. Like, like kids get to bring the honey to school. Because John and Mary, I've got to tell you, have a, a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. And they, it's just turnkey. And my God, that seems like such a universally cool thing for a family to have. And you can make it, they don't even need to think about it. Um, the help the planet one, that is, you just pay and you get a little deed, a little piece of paper that yes. says, you are a 116th owner and I'm going to go out and take a photo of your hive uh, once a month. And I don't know, some, I, I my friends, um, gifted me a part ownership of a coral reef someplace. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I get that one too. But there, forget the nonprofits. They have nothing to do with it. I mean, that's just where you stick the hive. But <laughs> the real customer here is the 60 people who you can convince to do this. And if you can get, how many people share a hive? By the way, well, in, it could in the, be in the, in it the, could, uh, adopt a hive per hive. You mean yeah? How many pe people per uh, yeah? How many we people? Could, we could go up to fifty easily per hive. Mm -hmm. We could supply wow. because you know part of buying into buying your share of the hive obviously is that I'm sending you some honey. Uh, you have to have that. So holy crap, that's amazing. How much do you? How much is the donation? The the donation. Right, right now it's fifty dollars per year. So what's that? Twenty five hundred dollars per year per hive. Per, correct. Is that enough to pay uh, to pay people? Yes. a good way yeah, to do all this. That actually, if we could achieve twenty five hundred dollars per hive per year, we would be sitting pretty. Because you know a fair hive management for one individual paying for me to maintain their hive for them, you know, somewhere between $800 and $1,000. Um, it's really hard to push people past that, even though it's really labor intensive. So if we could get $2,500 on a hive by breaking it up amongst many people, that would be nice. Really that would be really cool. nice. Yeah. Well, it sounds like that's, that's the full speed ahead. That's I mean, are what, there, uh, in other words, 
but it's not forget the hives for now. Yeah. Uh, you're a you're a marketing person selling fifty dollars shares and then figuring out how to distribute the honey back out. And even if you don't, you can place the hive. I guess you have to experiment with to what degree, what motivates someone to place to invest in it, to to adopt a hive. Mm -hmm. And one aspect of it, because one aspect of it is. The nonprofit piece of it. You're helping uh, yes. this nonprofit with their hive. The other one is you're helping the planet by pollinating. Yep. Because then Third you can potentially is... even, even double dip. Then you make these deals and go, normally it's going to be $2,500 a hive, but if you're willing to split half your honey, mm -hmm. we can get people to, uh, I don't know. Again, I'm not, I don't know the answer. This is what experimentation and risk taking and trial and error is all about is figuring out which of these approaches work. Right. Yeah. And I'm wondering if I should full steam ahead on this idea because it actually is scalable because I can have nonprofits in Colorado, nonprofits in California. I can be sitting in Virginia selling shares of hives. I can hire contract beekeepers to manage these hives. It's Bad all idea. digital. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I hate to cut you off, but I do want to cut you off because please do. I, I slap you in the face a few times. Stop, stop with the dreaming, okay? Stop with the dreaming. Once yep. you get to 75, I'll, I'll pick a number. Once you get to 100 hives in Virginia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great. Then uh, I don't care where your donors are. Right. Your hives are in Virginia, my dear. Yes. Got it. Because $2,500 does not a, uh, a, a well-paid employee make. Correct. All of your costs, uh, remember, you want to build the McDonald's, uh, oh God, I hate this analogy, but you know where I'm going with it. You, yeah. you want to build the McDonald's of hive management. Yeah. And you want to sell the timeshare of uh, of hive um, ownership. Yes. Um, and yes, you are absolutely right. You're, you, you're, you're gonna brag to me in 12 months, you're gonna go, we now have hive owners in all 50 states and in 17 other countries. <laughs> because <laughs> that would be amazing. this is equivalent of, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, for a while they had these crazy things where you can buy a crater on the moon <laughs> you buy, buy real estate, which is, a stu which is basically a, it's like a pet rock gift. Right, right. Um, and I don't, you know where my coral reef is? My <laughs> coral reef's in the Maldives. I can yes. give you with 100% certain I am never going to go visit my coral, <laughs> coral reef uh, any time in my <laughs> lifetime. And it's the same thing. But I get little pictures of my coral yep. reef. Uh, it sends me very nice little Christmas cards. It's actually more considerate than most of my friends. Yeah, exactly. uh, but I'm never going to see it. So right. yes, you come back and brag that in, that in a year you have, uh, you have hive owners in all 50 states and 17 countries. And then when I go, where are these hives? You go, they're all within a 10 mile radius of my house. Right. And I've been able to scale up to 100 hives to manage these uh, 5,000 um, hive owners using those save five employees. In fact, mm -hmm. don't tell them, don't tell the employees, you're down to three now. But only because you're so much more efficient because you have them right. all in one place and you're not having, the, your sales technique is so skilled. All right, exactly. so you can tell I'm going down this excited path about how you can scale this thing and how to focus on it, but don't lose sight of the other thing. Focus. Mm -hmm. Understand what the core of your market is and live and breathe and think that. And don't get distracted by someone who wants you to plant five acres of wildflowers. I mean, listen, you got to pay the bills in the short term. I get it. So yes, but you always in the back of your mind go, I'm only taking this gig because I'm working as a waiter because I'm going to eventually, I'm still going to acting classes. You have the dream. Don't get distracted from what you have to do to focus on what's important. And then the most important one is you're experimenting. We could have a whole nother podcast, which you don't have time for, about how to actually begin to figure out the most effective way to reach people, how to acquire these people, 
If you have yeah. a ninety eight percent retention rate, you're off to a great start. It says something. Because then, if you're if they're if they're paying fifty bucks um, a year, and you have an average lifetime of uh, three years, one hundred and fifty dollars, you can probably spend ten or fifteen dollar acquisition cost on them, and that and or better. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a that's great for mm -hmm. being able to acquire someone who's basically doing something which makes them feel good. And then right. your cost of goods is mostly your labor to manage the hive, um, mm -hmm. somewhat your shipping for the honey, somewhat your overhead. But you should be able to make that work. It's pretty cool. It's a great idea. I'm glad you stumbled onto it. And <laughs> um, I hope it works. Thank you. So uh, anything on my, my rambling uh, resonate? Yeah. Yeah, it did. I really appreciate the, uh, it's good to rein in on the dreaming because I've forgotten that I actually uh, have not turned a profit on the adopt a hive program at all yet. So let's start there. <laughs> <laughs> right now it's just costing money, but as you say, putting my mind towards, um, towards bringing in customers and trying to figure out how to communicate the value of this program to people. Um, and yeah, I and really, I really, really appreciate what you say too about my two types of customers because I really do have two types of customers, and I have I have customers who don't care really how much anything costs, and I have customers who really care how much things cost, and I want I want to communicate with them both, and I think that this might be the way. You're right; it's a luxury, but I mean, basically, the, the you basically go my it's two thousand dollars. And mm -hmm. it narrows my market, but at least if I want to pay a living wage, I can't mm -hmm. be in the business of um, giving two thousand dollars worth of service for five hundred dollars. Right. Just as much as it breaks my heart, I, if you do want to own a hive, this is fantastic. You share one. You get some mm -hmm. honey. You get regular reports on the health of your bees. You'll get a newsletter from me once a month. Um, yep. Get a postcard from the bees. I don't know whatever yep. you could come up with that. You find drives retention um, and virality. I mean, what are you going to do to get people who are current hive owners to tell their friends so they can become hive owners? Uh, you can begin tiering it. You can say there's a, ten, there's a $10 tier where you just feel good about it. <laughs> if <laughs> yeah, you want the honey, yeah. it's $70 a year. And if right. you have different categories, you get this little jar of honey for a $50 level. You get the pint jar at a yep. $100 level. I mean, there's all kinds of cool ways you can go with this. It's a really clever idea, and you're right. It does serve both your needs. So I think it's really cool, Allison. I wish you huge amounts of luck with it. Thank um, you so and, much. Um, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take my honey, uh, you know, w whenever you get, get around to it, that'll be great. This month. Sure. Although, yeah. for God's sake, I've got a massive bucket of honey down in our pantry from someone else who has people who have these hives for the pollination purposes end up drowning in the stuff. So Absolutely. Um, We've got it around. Um, I'm set. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good. Best of luck, Allison. Thanks for all the stuff you're doing for the planet. You know that that's an important thing for me as well. And let's hope we can turn this into a, a profitable business for you. I hope so. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Allison. Thanks. You know, some of the most interesting projects stem from personal passions. So I am really curious to see where Allison takes hers. But if you've got a personal passion you want to talk about and want to join me on the podcast or sign up for my mailing list or get an invite to the That Will Never Work Discord community, simply come to markrandolph.com. Or if you're feeling social, join me on Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, or Twitter. And did you know that there is an audio-only version of this podcast? You'll find it wherever you pick up your podcasts.